Boldwood presents A Love Letter to Paris, written by Rebecca Raisin and read by Bronwyn Price. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Chapter One Now, July My phone beeps with a text from my friend Emilienne that reads... I've been keeping a secret. I'm finally, madly, head over heels in love, thanks to a little-known matchmaking website called Paris Cupid. Why don't you join? If anyone deserves love, it's you. What Emilienne doesn't know is that I have a secret, too. I am Paris Cupid. Six months ago, on a cold February day, Emilienne cups her head and cries. I give her shoulder a useless pat as we sit side by side at Café des Capucines in the Ninth Arrondissimo. What can anyone really do for a heartbroken friend except be there and listen? I've just returned from a holiday to London, visiting my parents, who moved back to the UK recently, so this is the first chance I've had to comfort Emilienne in person. Dad is British and Maman is French. I've spent most of my life crisscrossing the English Channel because they could never make up their mind where they wanted to live before I settled for good in Paris in my early twenties. Truth be told, I went home to lick my wounds after a terrible breakup too, but I'm at the stage I want to forget it not rehash it. Besides, I'm here for M today, not for me. Emilienne's shoulders slump as she says, He told me I'm too intense, that my needs are too great. All I asked was if he wanted company at the gym, and suddenly I'm needy. Nothing ever goes the distance. It's been a few weeks since he broke it off, and Emilienne is still mourning the relationship. Is it me? Am I the problem? No, of course it's not you. I'm done with men. He wasn't the one for you, Em. Time and again, this comes up for my friend. If she's not being called needy, she's being called aloof, detached. It doesn't make sense. The waiter arrives with our café cremes, takes one look at Emelienne, and flees as if her sadness might be contagious. I encourage Emilienne to take a sip of her coffee as the waiter returns with a plate of colourful macarons. Excusez-moi, he says. These are for you. Emilienne gazes at him, her eyes glassy with tears. But we didn't order gratuit. He dashes away as quickly as he came. Ah, oh, Paris the city where a broken heart is recognised and remedied by a hit of sugar. Temporarily remedied, at least. See, I say, there's plenty of nice men around. Every day I read the most heartfelt, hard-won love stories in the letters I sell at the market. Sure, true love can be elusive, but it's out there, I promise you. You can't give up. Emilienne gives me a weary smile. Your love letters are from another era, Lilou. While they're beautiful mementos of yesteryear, life isn't like that these days. Romances like those are a thing of the past. She lets out a frustrated sigh. Maybe, maybe not, I say, as a murky idea takes shape. Could the lost art of love letter writing and slow burn romance be the answer? Can you fall in love with a person purely by their words alone? According to the bundles of love letters I stock at my stall in the Marché Dauphine at the saint Flea Market, you can. Those letters may be relics from the past, but that doesn't mean that sort of love doesn't exist anymore. You never know what's around the corner, Emilienne. My friend is usually a ball of energy, one of those early-to-bed, early-to-rise types who does yoga 
and goes on retreats to balance the days when she eats her body weight in souffle au fromage and washes it down with a demi bouteille of Sancerre. But this latest breakup has really done a number on her. It's hard to see her usually bright complexion so sallow, as if she's given up on all the good things she does for herself. We've all been there, eaten our way down a four-litre bucket of ice cream and chased it with a bottle of red wine to ease the hurt. But Emilian can't seem to shake off this latest breakup. It feels more like she's blaming herself rather than the fact they just weren't compatible. I suppose it stems from dating a string of familiar men, telling her a variation of the same sort of critique every time. And I get it. My dating history isn't exactly stellar. Are us unlucky in love types choosing the wrong men, or are we just going about this the wrong way? Maybe we need to change the method we use to find love, since it's clearly not working for either of us. Could I match Emilienne with a perfect man? She always goes for the health nuts, men with regimented gym routines, who wear too tight clothing and obsess over their green vegetable intake. These men don't seem to appreciate her, not the way she deserves. They're more likely to stand her up for an abseiling day, or something equally crazy. Time and again, she chooses the same type of guy, are we all making the same mistakes with love, on repeat? I picture her with a man who is passionate, not about his exercise regime, but Parisian life. He's cultured, but not pretentious. A reveller on occasion, but appreciates waking early to watch a sunrise or two. Happy to humour early morning jogs when the mood strikes her, but equally happy to stay in bed late, Sunday, with a scattering of newspapers and a lot of lazy kisses. Emilienne doesn't need platitudes about her lovability. She needs proof. More importantly, she needs to know she doesn't have to lower her standards to find her soulmate. But can I help her believe such a thing? It isn't like I have the best track record in relationships myself. Emilienne needs Cupid to shoot that arrow and snare her the type of man she'd never choose for herself. Could I make that work? Could I be Paris Cupid? Later that evening, rain lashes sideways at my apartment windows while I muse about my matchmaking idea. As I mindlessly scroll on social media, I discover more posts about shock breakups speedy divorces, or awkward dating app encounters. Why isn't love going the distance for some of us 30-somethings? There's that overarching fear that all the best men are married by now, and the clock is ticking to find whoever is left out there being set up by friends or using apps. Dating apps are the primary way in which my friends find love, and they work for a lot of people, but they're not for me. I tried them for a while, but shied away in favour of meeting the one meet cute style. A girl can dream, right? From what I can see posted online, there are others who find the rules of love just as mystifying. It's not exclusive to Paris either. Some of my British friends are facing the same struggles. What if there was another option? A matchmaking site for lonely hearts who have tried other avenues but want to take things slower. Really get to know one another by exchanging letters before they meet so they have a solid foundation that won't fizzle out within a few months. It could work. Matches won't exchange phone numbers. They'd exchange P.O. boxes. Instead of sending pictures, they'd send letters. All they'd share is their first names and what they do for work or a hobby to keep things mysterious as they get to know each other through words alone. They could fill out questionnaires about themselves, which would help me find them a suitable match. The idea needs fleshing out. But what if it worked? What if I could single-handedly help Emilienne and so many others like her find real abiding love? 
I could develop a bespoke matchmaking service for those who have given up on love or feel that love has given up on them. Designed for singletons, like Emilienne, like me, who find modern-day romance tricky to navigate after one too many messy endings. As I jot down notes, I use my own struggles in the dating world as inspiration for what I don't want Paris Cupid to be. I'm a heart-on-sleeve romantic and find myself weary having to constantly filter out the real from the fake. There's no such thing as old-fashioned courting anymore. It's all a great big rush to meet, to remain non-exclusive, that it tends to leave one a little deflated when time and again things end because they're not committed and only want a casual relationship. In my other life, I'm a merchant at a flea market. I sell love letters, diaries, ephemera from the past. That's where real love looms large. Men from bygone times who wrote sweeping promises in elegant prose. Women who declared their mutual adoration. These couples from the past always fell in love, achingly slowly through words penned on thick parchment, the memory of them standing the test of time. Why can't I recreate that sort of romance for my matches? It's always bothered me that we don't have love letters like these in the future, because these days, most correspondence is digital. Email doesn't quite cut it when it comes to looking back. Paris Cupid will remedy that injustice by bringing back the lost art of handwritten love letters, my matches will partake in a slow-burn romance, with no need to swipe right or Netflix and chill. My first goal will be to help Emilienne believe in love again. I make a detailed list of everything I'll need to do to get the business up and running, including building the website, writing the questionnaire, the rules and requirements for matches, and advertising to find clients. The plan is to make Paris Cupid exclusive and only accept those who are genuinely searching for the one. Anonymously, under the guise of an advertisement for Paris Cupid, I email Emilienne with a free introductory offer and then set out to find others like her. People who love has left bruised, wary and abandoned. People just like me. I'm a walking dating disaster story, so I happen to know a fair bit about what not to do in the course of true love. I'll have to keep the fact I'm Cupid quiet. I'm still reeling from Le Scandale at the market a month ago with a married man's wife. The man I was dating at the time. Chapter Two Seven months ago. The Scandal. Hugging my jacket tight, I chit-chat with acquaintances from the flea market while we wait in the queue at the outdoor cafe in the square. Soft rain falls as we huddle close. The queue grows steadily, as if almost every market vendor is desperate for a warm drink before their workday begins. It's a freezing January day, but even the bitter weather doesn't steal my smile as I tell a work friend all about my date with Frederick last night, a man who knows how to romance a woman. I feel a poke on the shoulder, a rather forceful poke. I turn to find a pretty 40-something woman who shoots me a look that's so venomous I can't help but recoil. When I look closer... It's obvious she's been crying. Her mascara is smudged and her eyes are puffy. Are you Lilu? She demands. Her voice so loud, it draws the eyes of most of my market friends in the vicinity. We? Oui? I can't place her. I'm sure I've never met this woman in my life. But the hostility radiates from her glare and is directed squarely at me. Do you enjoy sleeping with a married man? Did you think I wouldn't find out? My heart leaps into my throat. A married man? It can't be. Excusez-moi, are you sure you have the right person? 
Frederick isn't married. We've been seeing each other off and on for months, including every second weekend when he stays at my apartment. A married man couldn't go missing for an entire weekend, surely. Her face reddens. Are you or are you not sleeping with Frederick Beaumont? Humiliation cuts me to the quick as there are audible gasps around me. How embarrassing to have this play out in front of my market colleagues. Ah, uh, I... I close my eyes against the shock. I had no idea he was married. None. There must be some sort of mix-up, a misunderstanding. Well, the woman demands as she pulls her phone from her pocket and swipes until a picture of Frederick appears. That's him. Curled locks, crooked smile, playful gaze that makes me woozy. The woman flicks to another photo. There he is as a groom. How could I have missed this? I cough, clearing my throat, wishing I could teleport myself away. My mind spins with scenarios, and the dots suddenly join up. All those last-minute cancellations, the sporadic schedule due to his corporate job that had him flying all over France. He always switched his mobile off in my presence, which I'd put down to good manners and a reprieve from business calls. When I'd phone him late at night, he'd whisper sweet nothings, his voice low and sweet. He wasn't talking softly because he was in bed and sleepy, he was whispering so he didn't get caught by his wife. I'm a fool. And worse, this woman is as mad as hell, and rightfully so. I'm so sorry. I had no idea. He said his marriage ended a year ago. He'd told me they'd rushed into matrimony and realized soon after they weren't a good fit. He glossed over it as if it was a small speed bump on the road to finding real love, Opposites attract until they don't, kind of thing. The woman lets out a bitter laugh that sends a shiver down my spine. More vendors stop to watch the show. Did he neglect to mention his children? Her voice rises. All seven of them? Seven children? There are murmurs around me and many shakes of the head. I'm never going to live this down. My reputation is ruined, even though I had zero clue Frederick had a family, not one. As much as this shameful public display hurts, I can feel this woman's pain. It's a hundred times worse for her. I soften my voice and say, I didn't know he had children. That pig, that swine. Here I am believing I've finally found the one, and he's just as bad as the rest. Convenient. I swallow back tears. I didn't know. You've destroyed my family. I hope you're happy with yourself. No, I... Save it. I don't want to hear any more lies. She spins on her heel, cursing me as she leaves. Color races up my cheeks as the crowd eyes me suspiciously, including my market friend, who I'd been reminiscing with about my date. Now she turns her back to me, but not before she shoots me a withering glare. Do I continue to voice my innocence? Will they believe me? Just as I'm debating flight, Coraline, a slightly prickly woman in her forties, who has a flower stall near the entrance of the flea market, rushes over to me. Are you okay? I only caught the tail end of all of that. My tears finally spill as Coraline pulls me in for a hug. I swear I had no idea. I would never date a married man with a family. Shush, shush, I know you wouldn't. Out of everyone I'm familiar with at the market, Coraline is the last person I expected would comfort me. She's known for being a gossip and relishing in other people's misfortunes, but there are rare times when she shows a whole other side. I'm grateful for it today. Go, she says. Go to your stall and I'll bring you a cafe creme. Shoulders back, chin up. You've got nothing to be ashamed of. I give her a small smile, trying to ignore the shake in my legs. 
how can I ever trust a man again? Not only has he lied and cheated, but my hopes for finding the one are dashed again. Now I've got this woman's broken heart on my conscience. I scrubbed my face and looked beyond the crowd to avoid their stares. And somehow, I managed to lock eyes with a tall mountain of a man who surveys me long and hard, like he's trying to figure out a puzzle. Who is that? I hope it's not the wife's brother or someone on her side, ready to admonish too. I can't take any more today. Coraline follows my gaze. Ooh, la la. He's got the looks and the body to match. All I know is his name is Pascal, and he sells vintage typewriters in a stall in the middle of the market. Doesn't look like the approachable sort, though, does he? No, he looks the exact opposite. And why the intense stare? Has he never seen a woman being publicly humiliated before? There's something almost primal about the way he's locked his eyes onto mine. It's almost hypnotic. I find myself unable to look away, even though the desire to flee is strong. Chapter Three Now I'm woefully late to my day job after a long night of matching the lost, star-crossed and broken-hearted of Paris. The early July summer sunshine boosts my mood and makes the long walk to the market an enjoyable one. I find myself thinking back to when my little side business came to life. That wintry day when I met with a despondent Emilienne who had all but sworn off love. Her sadness felt like a plea for help, a call to arms, and it gets me thinking, why do we get punished when we set standards for love? It's not as though Emilienne was asking for too much. All she wanted to find in a relationship was kindness, monogamy, and the hope of building a future together. And now she has, thanks to the art of love letter writing. Since that fateful coffee catch-up, Paris Cupid has flourished, although I've had to keep my role anonymous. My name is still mud after Le Scandale. Not everyone has forgiven me, despite my protestations of innocence. And it didn't help matters when Frederick recently visited the market and told me he still loved me. I had to resort to using my broom to drive him away, and it dredged up the whole scandal again. There were whispers that I must be secretly seeing him, otherwise why would he drop by like that? The market is like a petri dish when it comes to gossip, and left unattended, it grows, multiplying until everyone hears an exaggerated version of the story that just isn't true. Having Paris Cupid to pour my time into has been good for me, in more ways than one, since men aren't exactly beating my door down to ask me on a date. Love has truly blossomed for a number of my matches, including Emilienne. Her kindred spirit is a man named Remy, who I found to be sensitive and soulful. He has a good understanding of healthy boundaries, which, according to her application, had been an issue with men in her past. Emilienne is the type of woman who needs her space, quiet time to retreat and reflect. And Remy agreed that was important to him, too. It's been a whirlwind since start-up six months ago, and it warms my heart that future generations might one day unearth these Paris Cupid love letters, sit with a mug of tea, settle in and read a sweeping romance, just like in the books. The only problem is, these days, my bespoke little matchmaking biz is taking a big chunk of my time, and I'm finding it hard to balance both worlds, my market stall and my secret Cupid life, hence my lateness this and every morning. Matching lovebirds also makes me yearn for my own love affair, but I still feel at odds with how to go about it for myself. Short of the universe throwing a man in my way, 
I don't see how it's ever going to happen, now that I'm working more than ever. To get enough matches so I could faithfully promise people a chance at love, I've had to come up with all sorts of advertising campaigns for social media. It's where most of my clients have found Paris Cupid, and I've tried other avenues of advertising, like letterbox drops, podcast ads, even a tiny little billboard at Montmartre bus station, and posters glued up around saint ouen flea market. Word of mouth referrals have been big as well. The income Paris Cupid is producing has really helped when I have slow weeks at ephemera, so I remind myself the extra work is worth it when I'm feeling the pressure of keeping everything afloat. As I increase my pace, I pass un kiosque à presse and catch sight of a magazine headline that stops me in my tracks. TV star Emmanuel Roux is engaged thanks to Paris Cupid. What? My heart leaps into my throat. I dig through my handbag for my purse and hand over some euros with a shaky, Bonjour, monsieur. Once I'm far enough away from the kiosk, I duck into an apartment doorway to read the article. Self-confessed playboy of Paris, Emmanuel Roux, from Twilight Dream TV fame, has found the one and proposed atop the Eiffel Tower. She is not from showbiz, he says. We were matched on a new underground site called Paris Cupid. We asked Emmanuel why the playboy of Paris would need to use a relatively unknown matchmaking site to find love. For anonymity, he claims. We did a little digging into Paris Cupid, a small Parisian startup that claims to find love for the lost, the lonely, and those who feel they're unlucky in love. This is no insta date hookup site. Members commit to writing love letters and getting to know one another slowly by good old fashioned courtship. My days as a bachelor are over, Emmanuel says, with a determined set to his jaw. This cannot be. I vet every single member as assiduously as possible with the skills I have at hand. I search their social media accounts and their online presence. So it comes as a nasty shock to find that I've matched the so-dubbed playboy of Paris without being aware of it. I'd never approve membership to a man who dates and dashes like Emmanuel Roux famously does. Did he use a pseudonym? Photos can easily be doctored these days, but I wouldn't have paid much attention to his pictures anyway. I'm more interested in what they write about love than their physical appearance. Whatever social media accounts he'd given me must have appeared legitimate when I did my first round of checks. My mind spins with worry. Who did he claim to be? And worse, who did I match him with? For all his protestations, I don't believe for a minute that Emmanuel Rue's playboy days are over. This is an unmitigated disaster for Paris Cupid, which I genuinely built for those who had given up on finding love. I also kept it exclusive so I could cope with a workload. I quicken my pace and head to Paris saint ouen flea market, to my stall, Ephemera, where I sell my love letters, prayer books and scribed diaries. Chapter 4 I open my stool, switch on my laptop, and glance up to make sure I'm alone. Satisfied there's no chance of being caught out, I search for Emmanuel Roux's pseudonym on Paris Cupid. As I scroll through the membership list, my frustration increases. I'm breaking a cardinal rule by working on Paris Cupid at Ephemera and risking my anonymity. Worse, I can't see a single man who doesn't appear real. Their stories are all so touching, I get lost down the rabbit hole, checking their statuses and making notes on couples I have to liaise with. Finally, at the very end of the list, I see a potential, and my heart judders to a stop. Mad! How can I have made a mistake as epic as this? 
There, in bold, is the name of the woman I matched Emmanuel Rue, a.k.a. Remy Tattoo, with... Emilienne Lyon, my friend and the first ever member of Paris Cupid. I cut my face and resist the urge to wail. Emilienne, the unwitting inspiration behind the matchmaking site, now believes Emmanuel Rue, of all people, is her soulmate. The power of suggestion is a heady thing. Have I exposed her to a man who will break her heart and publicly humiliate her? So far, he's kept her name out of the press. But now the media have caught the scent, it won't be long until they hunt down the newly engaged couple and splash their pictures all over the internet. What have I done? Emmanuel and Emilienne. It even sounds farcical. How did he persuade Emilienne that he's truly retired his Playboy of Paris status? It boggles the mind. But if the article's to be believed, he must have convinced her well enough that she's accepted his hand in marriage. Or is it because I, playing my part as Paris Cupid, told her in no uncertain terms Remy Tattoo, a.k.a. Emmanuel Rue, is compatible to her in every way? The slippery snake has really done a number on me. I bring up his application and reread. It's poetic, heartfelt, and honest. Ha! The lamentations of a man who claims to be ill-fated when it comes to love, despite his best intentions. The fraudulent application makes my teeth grind. But really, I'm responsible for any fallout. There's nothing I can do about it at the moment, so I shut down my computer and distract myself with my morning routine at Ephemera. I wheel out my display tables and arrange stock, water my plants, give the rugs a quick vacuum. Soon, the market is filled with shoppers, laughter, shouting, chit-chat. Outside, horns are blaring, sirens wailing, the soundtrack of our market days. Feather duster in hand, I make my rounds when I spot the arrival of one of my neighbours as he stomps up the stairs, his familiar scowl in place. I hide behind a postcard carousel and spy on prickly Pascal as he unlocks his stool. In the month or so since la réorganisation du marché, the big market vendor reshuffle, Pascal has managed to find fault with me numerous times. Allegedly, my display tables are too wide, and it's not fair to the others who share the hall. My rose-scented candles give him a headache. My lavender plants attract bees, even though we're indoors and upstairs. And on and on it goes. Each complaint has caught me unawares. I'm not used to such criticisms. I've done my best to remedy these issues, but then he comes back with another problem. Who are you hiding from? A velvety voice rings out and manages to snare Pascal's attention. He looks over in my direction. I do the adult thing and drop to the wooden floor, hoping it will open and swallow me whole. The last thing I need is him storming over here again. Genevieve, shush! Glamorous Genevieve is one of my neighbours in Marché Dauphine, and my very best friend, despite being 20, or maybe even 30 years senior to me. It's hard to gauge exactly what age she is, as she has a timeless quality about her, and is the least grown-up person I know. Lilou, honestly, that's no place to sit. Genevieve shakes her head as if I've lost my marbles. Maybe I have. Get up this instant. She's bossy at the best of times, but Genevieve has the sort of presence that commands a person to do as they're told. I'm sure I can feel Pascal's laser-like gaze on me. Like the ultimate grown-up I am, I edge backwards on all fours like a hunted animal, which is surprisingly difficult, and take cover behind my desk. I'd be mortified if he caught me spying on him. It would only give him more ammunition. 
he'd probably put a complaint to market management about me making him uncomfortable or something equally wild. Is he looking over here? I ask as I duck my head and make a show of shuffling paperwork so she can't rebuke me again. Who? She dons her bejeweled spectacles. Genevieve is so extra and gazes across the hall. Oh, is that the delectable Pascal? You should ask him on a date. This is a clear case of grumpy sunshine. I scoff. For the past month, Genevieve has impatiently listened to my litany of complaints about the guy, and this is what she comes up with. I hardly think a relationship between us will evolve like it does in the books, Genevieve, unless it's a true crime novel. Don't you always see this with warring neighbours? One ends up worse off or dead. I massage my temples as a headache looms. I'm not usually so testy. I blame it on the morning I've had. No, no, no. This is how they always start out. The couple can't stand the sight of each other. Genevieve has a penchant for romance novels. The spicier, the better. Most of her advice comes from such tomes. And then, voila, love hearts for eyes. Well, lucky for me, my life is non-fictional. What I don't tell Genevieve is, I do find Pascal's abrupt, unsunny disposition slightly alluring. And how ridiculous is that? Part of me wants to get to the root of why he's so abjectly bothered all the time. He's not much of a talker. Why use a string of words when a grunt will suffice? But as a professional in the world of true love, I see it for what it is, an act. Those red flags are waving so hard, they're impossible to ignore. Look at him. There's something almost wild about him. Prrr. I roll my eyes. Really? Did you just purr? This is what she's like. Absolutely man-mad. Genevieve has a new beau every season, claiming her love is fluid and that she'll never be tied down to one man. Despite her fickle heart, though, she remains good friends with all of her exes. Everyone wants to be in her spotlight as either friend or beau. What? She reluctantly draws her gaze away from the delectable Pascal and back to me. Genevieve leans close and whispers, You're a successful matchmaker, and yet you can't see what's right in front of you? You make a valid point, I agree, peeking over the top of the desk to make sure no one is eavesdropping on our conversation. Only Genevieve knows my secret, and I intend to keep it that way. For some unfathomable reason, my matchmaking abilities don't translate to my own love life. How is that fair? It's a bone of contention, but who would I complain to? Truthfully, I've searched applications looking for a man who might be right for me, but it feels like it would be a breach of trust setting myself up. If it came to light I was Paris Cupid, it wouldn't look good. And after Le Scandale, I'm not keen for the spotlight to be trained on me like that ever again. Right now, no one suspects the quiet bookworm who sells quirky ephemera is the creator of Paris Cupid. It's my intention to keep Paris Cupid select, manageable and anonymous, to keep my secrets safe. I'm obsessed with love in all its guises, yet somehow... Real love eludes me. Another reason to remain anonymous. Members wouldn't have any faith in my abilities if they knew about my own dating history. I've been catfished, gaslit, stood up, friend-zoned, had my share of situationships, and most recently got caught up with married man Frederick with his rather large brood of children, that catastrophe has made me somewhat reluctant to dip a toe back in the dating pool. 
You could say even my expectations are at an all-time low. Besides, I don't have time right now. I'm too busy helping other hopefuls. Genevieve shakes her head as if she too is befuddled by it. Such a riddle. You've set up so many couples, yet love remains elusive for our resident Cupid. Her face softens with sympathy. You know what they say, lucky at cards, unlucky in love. I shrug. Is it me? Am I too much of a daydreamer? Too caught up with work and Paris Cupid? If only the perfect guy would appear, like they do in the movies, where I'm walking along, head in the clouds, and oops, we bump into one another, my handbag goes flying, and then we lock eyes, and the rest is history. Or is that just rom-coms giving me unrealistic expectations? I'm debating whether to confide in Genevieve about the Emmanuel Rue development when Pascal cranes his neck my way. I drop my head to the desk, much to Genevieve's chagrin. Why would you want to hide from Pascal anyway? I drag my attention back to Genevieve, so I can avoid conversation. Her eyebrows pull together. What? Why? Because he complained a few times? A few? He's intimidating. Look at that scowl, the fire in his eyes. I don't speak his language. Grunts, that is. And after Emmanuel Rue taking advantage, I'm feeling a little more feisty than usual. So if he does stomp over here, I'm not going to be conciliatory this time. Genevieve lets out a string of tarts. Have a listen to yourself, Lilou. This is exactly the challenge you'd set for a woman on Paris Cupid, advising them to write and get to the root of the person's mind and soul before judging them. Yet here you are, bent like a pretzel behind your desk. I'm working, Genevieve, as you can very well see. I vehemently shuffle paperwork, so she can see the truth right before her very eyes. She heaves a theatrical sigh and snatches the paperwork from my hands. This is nothing but a prop. Are you going to spend the rest of your natural-born life hiding from him? A nice, healthy response from someone who advises others on such matters. It's almost as if I can hear her eyes roll. Mad. She's right, though. Why should I hide? I was here first, before la réorganisation du marché, which brought this egotistical megalomaniac into my work life and made it infinitely worse. A month ago, la réorganisation du marché. Genevieve arrives unusually early, before the market is even open to customers, which is very out of character for her. She's wearing a swishy summery dress that's perfect for the mild June summer weather. Bonjour, Lilou, she says, kissing me hello. Our new neighbors arrived today, so I thought it's best I am here to help welcome them. The powers that be decided to reorganize the market, bringing together vendors with similar customer bases. We've said goodbye to our previous neighbours and await the influx of the new ones, feeling hopeful they'll be just as nice as the ones we had before. Aren't they lucky to have your attention so early in the morning? Ha! She opens her handbag and removes a compact mirror, checking her lipstick. You're right. I'm not a morning person. Is that a crime? But truthfully, I snuck in early to pop Paris Cupid brochures in the vendor pigeonholes to see if we can drum up some love around these parts. What do you think? Genevieve is always thinking of new ways to spread the word about Paris Cupid and often helps delivering marketing material of her own accord. Great idea. 
I've set up around 30 couples since Paris Cupid began back in February. Of those, a handful weren't compatible, so I matched them again. A few people have decided it's not for them for various reasons. One said he found the process too slow. Another woman said she found it dull. Not everyone will make it or find true love. But I'm willing to help the ones who are in it for the long haul. Would you ever try Paris Cupid for a match? I ask, as I'm genuinely curious. It's not that she has any trouble finding paramours. It's more that I wonder if this way of seeking out a partner intrigues her. No, ma chérie, it wouldn't be for me. I like my men with a bit of grrr, those robust take-charge types who keep me on my toes. I'm surprised by how many men have signed up who yearn for romance too. It's not that they're beater at all. It's more that they like the idea of a slow seduction. It's quite sensual, this way of meeting someone and opening up to them. Huh, I do like the sound of slow seduction. I must admit, French men can be deliciously romantic and wildly poetic, so it makes sense this would appeal. That goes for men and women. Oh, here's one of our new neighbours. A must ginger-haired thirty-something guy bounds up the stairs, carrying bags and boxes that don't seem to weigh him down. He gives us a cheeky smile as he deposits his things before dashing over to us. Bonjour, je suis Felix. Bonjour, bonjour, I say. I'm Lilou, and this is Genevieve. What do you sell? Felix nods, acknowledging us both. Lovely to meet you beautiful ladies. I sell vintage printing press parts, and I design posters, cards, and other paraphernalia using movable type to paper. It's a lost art form, and using traditional printing methods is time-consuming, but a worthy endeavor, if I do say so myself. He speaks fast and gesticulates wildly, as if he has an abundance of energy that has to go somewhere. I like him instantly. Felix the flame-haired printer is just the type of personality we need around here to bring customers up those stairs. We tell him about what we sell and about the amount of foot traffic we get in the Marché Dauphine, which is decent compared to other parts of the market, but could always be better. He just might be the answer to that. I'd hazard a guess that he's the type of person who makes friends with everyone. I'm thrilled to have been chosen to move here, he says, running a hand through his hair, which sticks up in all directions. I've been in the north corner, tucked away behind the maintenance office, a spot rarely visited and also difficult to find. This place is going to be much better for business. Let us know if you need any help with... Anything. Genevieve gives him an exaggerated wink. She cannot help herself if there's a good-looking man in her presence. Felix waggles his brow. Great, now we have two incorrigible flirts in our midst. Like Genevieve, Felix is a breath of fresh air, who I know will make market days just that little bit lighter. Merci, Genevieve. Perhaps we can all share a drink after work sometime and get to know each other better. We chat for a bit, until there's more footsteps on the stairs. Au revoir, I better get myself sorted, Felix says, while looking intently at the newcomer. Bonjour, I'm Benoit, the man says when he reaches the top of the stairs. He gives us a shy smile and continues to his stall, which is right beside Felix's and across the small hallway from Genevieve and me. With eyes comically wide, Genevieve motions with her head in Benoit's direction, in case I haven't latched on to the fact that he is rather beautiful in a bookish, intelligent kind of way, with his neatly parted hair and spectacles and his hot, introverted bookworm kind of vibe. 
Has the universe heard my pleas for love? Suddenly, there are two very handsome men in my vicinity. Just as I'm about to tell Genevieve to cool it, there's a commotion on the stairs. A mountain of a man speaks angrily into his phone as he takes the steps two at a time, shouting curse words in French. The quiet calm has been replaced by this hulk, who has managed to get all of our attention, yet is blithely unaware of us. Oh, that alpha male energy, Genevieve says, fanning her face. Seriously? No. How can she be taken in by a man like that? Is he really so self-absorbed that he doesn't know his bellowing might be considered rude in a workplace, and that he's really not making the best first impression with us, his new neighbours? I sneak a peek at Felix and Benoit to see what they make of it, and find them sharing a small smile, as if they find the guy slightly amusing rather than rude. Lilu, that man is gorgeous. Can you not see that? That surly alpha male energy is exactly the thing that Paris Cupid is designed to be the antithesis of, and for very good reason. Those highly combustible types who breathe fire are just such a cliché, are they not? Well, she prods, I don't want to agree on principle, but I can't deny the man is rather hot. If you're into tall, muscular bad boys, then yes, I suppose so. But I could never be into someone so lacking in manners like he clearly is. Who do you think he's yelling at like that? I debate whether to politely inform him that he's creating a nuisance when he shoots a glare my way. My breath catches as I recognise him, but can't place from where. Oh no, the man in the market square, the day of Le Scandale. The one who locked eyes with me for so long, I swear he could see into my very soul. Coraline.